last minute, just in time. All the flames, they went down in the flame. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so on the dot paper below is the drawing of a fish at growth stage one. <clears throat> For each stage of growth, each of the fish's sides grows longer by one unit. On the dot paper, <laughs> the dot stop there for some reason. Paper. Draw the fish for growth stage two through growth stage, <laughs> excuse me, six. So this is one, 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 one. So we want to go two, 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 right? So leave yourself enough space. So if you start here, you go like two to there, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and two down here. And is that right? And then, yeah, like that. And like that. Like that. Okay, so stage two. And then you want to do stage three and four and five and six, right? And make sure you can fit it in or use a pencil just in case you can't. It requires like some erasing. And I'll pause this while we draw. Okay, so we have drawn fishes, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, stage five, stage, I ran out of space. There's a relation between the growth stage and the number of dots making the perimeter of the fish. Use your diagrams to complete the first six columns of the table of values below. Okay, so y'all can see this because it's in front of you, so I'm going to rely on you for some answers. Growth stage one, how many number of dots making the perimeter? Six. Six? Everybody agree? Okay. Stage two. What? Okay. Stage two, how many dots make the perimeter? I don't know. You said that rather questioningly. Thirteen. Okay, talk quietly amongst yourselves, come to a consensus. <laughs> it's like none of it government, eh? Consensus, <laughs> we'll do math by consensus. So what is there, 13? Okay, stage three. 20? Okay, do we have a consensus of at least two people agree? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> stage four. This will probably be the last one you can. 27, right now. Do we need to continue counting? No. So what's next? And then? And then? So just use your patterning stills to complete the last four slash six columns, whatever. And then? And then? And then? And then right. Good stuff, right? So. <clears throat> A lot of mathematics was developed by looking for patterns, right? So you got numbers, you look for pattern in the numbers. And then you say, yeah, okay, I think I see a pattern here. Uh, let me try some more, okay? So we did like six stages. We actually counted the six stages. We should find there really are 41 in there, right? Then, then you come up with a hypothesis, right? Hmm, it seems that every growth stage I'm going to add seven dots, right? Okay. So, these pattern skills, check. This relation can be described with a set of ordered pairs, right? The set of ordered pairs that describes this relation. It's a set, so we use set notation. Okay, so you use the brace bracket. And then the ordered pairs, right? So, growth stage one, six, two, 13, 320, 427. 534, 641, 748, and it's not going to fit on one line. 855, 962, and 1069. So make sure that each ordered pair is contained within a set of parentheses with a comma between the numbers, and that the set of ordered pairs is contained within the brace brackets. Okay, how are we doing? Good to go? 
moving. You know, many of them I saw like a number of like 24, so we're on five now. We're one sixth away. Okay, recall that a function is a relation where no, no two ordered pairs have the same x, x coordinate. Is the above relation a function? Yes. <laughs> yes, I got caught halfway through the line. Recall that the domain of a relation is a set of all possible values of the of the one. one. Domain, domain. <laughs> Independent variable. Yeah, that's just like way too big a line for writing x. <laughs> So that's the independent variable. Write the domain of this relation. Domain is a set. And there is the set, right? Set consists of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Recall that the range of relations set of all possible values of the dependent variable. Right now you are all a bunch of dependents and your parents would like you to be independents. Write the range of this function. So these are the x variables, right? Domain is the x variables, the independent or the x variable, and the range is the y variables, and what was that, 6, 13. The domain of this relation is a <coughs> subset of the natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, comma, dot, 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 and the dot, 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 there's one too many dots in that, dot, or, and it was like four, it should be three, yeah. What's three dots called? Oh, uh, Starts with an E. Ellipsis. Ellipsis, yeah. Just means and so on, right? Keep going. A function with a domain that is a subset of the natural numbers is called a sequence. Since we know that the domain of a sequence will always start at 1, 2, 3, we concentrate more on the range of the sequence, right? So we know the domain. It's always going to be 1, 2, 3, and so on. The values in the range are called the terms of the sequence. The first six terms of the above sequence are 6, 13, 20, 27, 34, and 41. Right? So the range is what forms the terms of the sequence. The domain simply tells us which term. So if you're looking at the ordered pair of 1, 6, it says the first term is 6. If you're looking at the ordered pair of <coughs> 10, 69, the tenth term is 69. Right? And we're just going to kind of drop the first term, so just worry about the second terms or the range. What is the first term of the sequence? This term is denoted by t sub 1, which is read t sub 1, right? just because it's a subscript. Okay, so you could call it T1 or T sub 1. Both could just call it T1. Okay, what's T1? Six. six. What is the sixth term of the sequence? <coughs> this term is denoted by T6. 41. How do we denote the tenth term? T sub 10. T sub 10. is when we really got to say sub, right? Because we're saying this out loud. Okay, so I can't say, well, I, if I say T10, what does that mean? Right, so you say T sub 10. So make sure your subscripted are <clears throat> written in a smaller font, so adjust the font size. You can just use your brain and start to say, write a smaller number and do it from below. <clears throat> what is the tenth term of the sequence? 69. 12. Hey, we're almost like halfway to that 24. The relation between the growth stage number and the number of the dots can also be described with words. Complete the following sentence to describe how to determine the number of dots for a particular growth stage. Okay, to determine the number of dots, take the growth stage and do what? Well, that doesn't work for the first growth stage. Is the first growth stage like what? So, 
need, need to come up with something that's going to work for anything, right? So if I say, uh, to turn on and take the growth stage, so for example, if the growth stage is 6, then I should be able to take the 6, do something to it, and come out with a 41. 6 x plus 1. I don't know what x is. Okay, so you, wouldn't x be the growth stage? Well, then if x is the growth stage, then... Multiply by 6. Okay, so then growth stage 10 would be 6 times 10 plus 1 is 61. Okay, that doesn't work. Try again. Okay, does that work? Yeah. Oh, wow, it does. Okay, so take the growth stage and multiply it by 7. Then subtract 1. And then what you do is you check that out, right? I think that's what the pattern is, right? I mean, that's what had to be thought before it was mentioned, and then you then you try a few. Does that work? Okay, growth stage 6. 6 times 7 is 42, minus 1 is 41. Woo! Okay, how about 10? 10 times 7 is 70, minus 1 is 6. Great. All right, it seems to work, right? Keep going. Use your results to determine the number of dots for growth stage 20. So what are we going to do? Number of dots will be 20 times 7 minus 1. One thirty-nine. How many dots are there in growth stage n? 7n minus 1, right? Perfect, right? Number of dots. I don't know. Let's, let's say d is equal to 7n minus 1. Right, let's go put a D up here. Although in a sense that was a really bad letter to choose, but you know what I got. The <laughs> memory must be twigged by usually there's an email that goes on. Um, the general might well have been. I just might not have read it. The general term of sequence is denoted by T sub n. Pretty much, we say T sub n as opposed to like T n, because T n just ends up being like somebody's name, right? So we say T sub n, and it's called the nth term. Write an expression for the nth term of the sequence. Okay. So really, this is the nth term, right? So T sub n. Now, <clears throat> what that means is you're going to see an n in on the right-hand side, right? So T sub n, and then there has to be some relation to the n. So I can't put like 7x minus 1. It has to be the n. So if we say T 10, then we go 7 times 10 minus 1, which is equal to 69. Take one of each. The general term of a sequence relates the term to the term number. No, really, exactly. Take one each. Here. Oh, guess it over there. <laughs> Verify the expression for t sub n with the fifth term of the sequence. To do this, substitute n equals 5 into the expression and show that the fifth term is 34. So let's start off with the formula. Okay, so what's math all about, right? Formula, substitute into the formula, get an answer, check the answer, is it good? So we want T5, so T sub 5 or T5 is equal to 7, so wherever I see an N, I'm going to put a 5, which is 35 minus 1, which is 34, and, you know, if I like, I can keep this T sub 5 running down the, the thing. Okay, woohoo, yes, right? It works, great. There are 559 dots making the perimeter of a fish. Use your general term formula to determine the growth stage of the fish. Okay, start with the formula. Now, what number do we substitute and what do we substitute it for? The T sub n, we substitute 559. Mm -hmm. 
So we know how many dots. Remember, T sub n is how many dots. So 5, 5, 9 is 7n minus 1. First step in the solution is to do what? Add 1 to both sides, right? 560 is 7n. So what's n? You don't need a calculator, right? Yeah, it's 80. It's okay. You can use calculators, right? Except in calculus, then you can't use calculators. Then we make the numbers reasonably easy. You might actually have to do a multiply or something, but but they're not, you know, they're not hard numbers. Actually, difficult numbers. Sequences. <clears throat> a sequence can be thought of as an ordered list of objects. Some examples are 5, 8, 11, 14, 17, 20, 23, 2, 6, 18, 5, 4, 1, 6, 2, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21. Anybody know what that sequence is called? Famous Fibonacci. sequence. Fibonacci sequence. Named after? Fibonacci. 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 Also known as Leonardo of Pisa. What is it? Uh, we're not getting into that. Go, you Google it. <laughs> no, it's serious. It's Fibonacci. F-I-B-O-N-A-C-C-I. It's a very interesting sequence, you know, like for you to look it up and, and then just go, wow, that's kind of neat. Like, how did this guy come up with that? Rabbits, that's how. Rabbits. Seriously. Rabbits. rabbits. Yes. I kid you not. They're hopping around Calgary. Well, Fibonacci just thought about rabbits and up came the Fibonacci sequence. And it's all over nature. Right? Like the, 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 the whirls on a pine cone or on a pineapple related to the Fibonacci sequence, the way the branches are spaced on a tree, you know, how they branch out from each other, Fibonacci sequence. Anyways, the first term of the sequence is denoted by T1. It used to be the little letter A. So if I ever use a little letter A, say, you should write T1 instead. Um, the nth term of the sequence is denoted by T sub n and is called the general term, where n is the term number, right? Called the general term because we can substitute any value of n and then get the value of the term. <clears throat> a sequence can have a fixed number of terms, call that finite, okay, it ends, uh, or have an infinite number of terms, we call that infinite, which we don't pronounce that way, we call it infinite. Um, classify the above sequences as finite or for no, because fine, finite ends. So finite <clears throat> is this finite or infinite? Finite. Finite. Is this finite or infinite? <clears throat> Both of these are infinite, right? Okay. What tells us that it's infinite? The ellipsis. Sometimes the ellipsis appears in the middle. Let's have a long sequence. I want to do the natural numbers from 1 to 100. I could write 1, comma, 2, comma, 3, comma, dot, 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 comma, 99, comma, 100. Right? And then I'm saying, well, I want you to continue, <clears throat> continue along this way, but I don't feel like writing out you know, these, all these terms. But you got the idea, right? It starts this way, it ends this way. You can fill in what comes in between. No, wait. We did that, right? Look at this, eh? I can move back and forth between. Only took how long? How many months? Figured this out? Types of sequences. For each sequence, describe a rule that will generate a term from the previous term and then write the next two terms. Okay, so as you mean, we're pretty good at this, right? So what we're looking for is I want you to say, you should do something to this term, and that's where it'll get you the next term, right? So it could be like multiply by 2 or add 5 or, you know, subtract 3. Okay, so what do we do? Add 5. Add 5. So what's the rule? Add 5. So what are the next two terms? Okay, 18, 20.5. 20 23, 25.5. What's the rule? Add 2.5. So it's an exercise, 28 and 30.5. 12, 5, negative 2, negative 9. What's the rule? Subtract 7. Subtract 7. What are the next two terms? <coughs> 
2040. Times two. So let's say multiply by two. Right. And what we're doing is say, what do I do to the previous term to get the next term? I take the previous term, 40 multiplied by 2, and I get 80 times 2 is 160. 7, negative 21, 63, negative 189. <laughs> it's OK, it's a stretch. But... Multiply by negative 3. OK, now we might actually need calculators. So negative 189 times negative 3 is? Is it negative or is it positive? It's positive. And it is positive. 567. 567. Wait, I can do this. So it's going to be 1500, 1680, 1901. Negative 1901. Negative 1701. Negative 1701. What should, yeah, so it's 1680 and 21. How do I get 1901? Use your calculators. 84, 42, 21, 21 over 2. Rule? Divide by, two. Divide by 2. You know another way to express that? What's another way to express that? Multiply by a half. Multiply by a half. Why would I do that, right? Because I don't want to go 21 over 2 divided by 2, right? I can multiply that by a half easy, right? What do I get? 21 over 4. Then what? 21 over 8. If I'm going to take 21 over 2 and divide it by 2, then uh, you end up multiplying by half. Multiply by 1 half. Okay, so 21 over 4, 21 over 8. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21. What's the rule? Add the two previous terms together. Go ahead, do it. Keep going. It is. Uh, so the rule is, so this one we're, we're not doing to the previous term, right? We're using the previous two terms. So add the previous two terms. Now, what we're doing here, <clears throat> which is something I don't think we really study anymore as such, but these definitions that we've given are called the recursive definition. So the recursive definition is, what do I do to a term to get the next term, right? As opposed to a general rule. So in that first sequence, 24, 29, 34, 39, 44, 49, if I said, hey, what's the tenth term, what would you have to do? You'd have to keep going until you hit the 10th term, right? And, and you'd say, yeah, OK, I can do that. It's not that bad, right? So then what's the 100th term? Well, at that point, you're saying, you know what? It would be a lot easier if I had that t sub n, and I could just plug in 100, right? Like if I had a formula as opposed to. So recursive definition is just in terms of the previous term or terms, what do you do? Now, that's really easy for us to work on. So what do we got? 34 and then 55, right? <clears throat> Next one is 89, and so on. Okay, but if I want to generate a particular term, then I want a formula. Right? Give me a formula. You know, what's t1000? Well, I do not feel like, you know, so I'd have to work out a formula for that. Sequences where the same number, positive or negative, is added to each term to create the next term are called arithmetic sequences. Oh, okay, come on. I'll pause. But back up, which we can do now. OK, so what's arithmetic? Let's circle the arithmetic sequence. So is A arithmetic? Yes. Yeah, actually, let's write a big A next to it. Is B arithmetic? Is C arithmetic? Is D arithmetic? Is E arithmetic? Is F arithmetic? Is G arithmetic? OK, so we have three arithmetic. Why don't we pronounce it arithmetic? Because it's the same. You gotta love English, don't you? Especially those who are learning English and saying, really? Come on. You say arithmetic sequence, and then you call the act of adding and subtracting stuff. That's arithmetic. OK, state which is seek. So we, what were they? A, B, and C, right? A, B, C. 
The sequence, <coughs> 12, 16, 20, 24, 28, comma, dot, dot, dot. Seriously? Take it out. Is an infinite arithmetic sequence. State the difference between the following consecutive terms. So what's 16 minus 12? What's 20 minus 16? What's 24 minus 20? What's 28 minus 24? Or what do you say when you hit the golf ball? Four. Three. Yes. Three. Note that for arithmetic sequences, the difference between consecutive terms is the same. And if it's always the same, then we call that constant. Okay, so it's constant, right? We're always adding the same number. We are adding a constant. See, if you're ever in doubt about what goes in, <laughs> this constant is called the common difference, D. For the sequence 12, 16, 20, 24, 28, the common difference is 4. State the common difference for the arithmetic sequences in question 19. All right, you can see it. I can't. So for, for A, what's the constant difference? 5. For B, 2.5. And for C, okay. So it's called the constant difference, right? It's an arithmetic sequence. Uh, come on. 22. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sequences where the each term. Does yours say the each term? Or does yours just say each term? Yeah, I know. Every time we, we see it, we take note of it, and then we don't change it. Where each term is multiplied by the same number to create the next term are called geometric sequences. State which of the sequences in question 19 are geometric. So what do we got? D, E, F. Is that it? Def? 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 Definitely it. <laughs> what? I can't hear you. The sequence 2, negative 8, 32, negative 1, 28 is a finite, right? It ends, unlike class, which seems to be infinite. <laughs> Geometric sequence. State the ratio of the following consecutive terms. What are the ratios that we take? <clears throat> so in arithmetic sequences, we take the difference between two terms. Right? We take the term that's further along the sequence, subtract, because we're really saying, well, what did you add to get this, right? So we take a term that's out here minus the previous term and say, well, you add. So in geometric, we're dividing. So negative 8 divided by 2 is? 32 divided by negative 8 is? Negative 128 divided by 32 is? Note that for geometric sequences, the ratio of consecutive terms is constant. Yeah, you're learning it. Read ahead. Constant. It's either that or it's the same, right? But the same doesn't make any sense in this case. This constant is called the common ratio, right? Just look, dividing, it's like a ratio. It's not like a ratio either. Uh, R. For the sequence, 2, negative 8, 32, negative 1, 28, the common ratio is? Negative 4. State the common ratio for the geometric sequences. So for D, what's the common ratio? So R equals 2. For E, R equals negative 3. And for F, that's what I know, right? 1 half. That's another reason why I didn't want to say divide by 2. Because what we want to do with this ratio is say we're always multiplying by it. So we will never say, oh, divide by 3, right? We'll just say multiply by 1 third. Are we there yet? In an arithmetic sequence, each successive term is formed by blank a constant to the previous term. Adding. Adding. Uh, this constant is called the common difference. And D is equal to T2 minus T1. 
or T3 minus T2, or T sub N minus T sub N minus one, right? This would be like N is 100, this would be T100 minus T99. In other words, take any term, subtract from it the previous term, you get the common difference. So if you do that like twice in the sequence, and you say, hey, this minus this is four, this minus this is four, then you know you're dealing with an arithmetic sequence. In a geometric sequence, each successive term is formed by not this, but a what operation? Multiplying. Multiplying what? A constant. Multiply, oh, mul oh, sorry. Multiplying the previous term by, blank was too big, by a constant. Oh, nice. As long as in the end it's correct, it really doesn't. This constant is called the common ratio. And you may find the common ratio by taking any term and dividing it by the preceding term. You're going to recognize it by looking at it and saying, hey, if I multiply this by 2 and that by 2 and that by 2, then I generate a <coughs> sequence, right? And then you verify that by taking a term and dividing it by the previous term. And you do that a few times and you say, hey, it's always 2. Then I know I'm dealing with the geometric. Some sequences are neither arithmetic nor geometric. <coughs> the sequence in question 19 is neither arithmetic nor geometric. Uh, G, I don't know. I think it's G, right? Because we, we ended up on L. Uh, this pure sequence is called the Fibonacci sequence and has a large number of applications in nature. It's like, I think nature came up with it before Fibonacci did. He <laughs> sort of discovered that, hey, it's, it's, yeah. But you'll see it a lot, right? So I, seriously, you know, if you got nothing else to do on the weekend, just Google Fibonacci. Yeah, it's because it's close to snow or something. Like that. Wait, was it actually? No. <clears throat> well, you live in Calgary. If it snowed in May, how surprised should you be? Yeah, not very, right? It's like, do you still have your snow? Yes, I still have my snow tires on. It's because the average daily temperature has not reached 7 degrees Celsius. Have you seen those ads, right? 7 degrees Celsius is the cutoff point. Below 7 degrees, so average temperature below 7 degrees Celsius, you should be running winter tires. At, at this point, you're pretty safe on all season tires, but all season tires are really three season tires, right? Like that ad is correct. Except in that case, the seasons aren't really equal in length because winter is like six months ago. Uh, is that it? Okay, so I don't want to hit.